what we're going to be covering today is seven elements of insanely persuasive product demos. And each of these elements is uh, what you could say, count it there. each one is a little bit counterintuitive. And each counterintuitive element that you're going to learn on this webinar is paired with an intuitive principle that most people do that actually leads to failure. Okay, they lead to failure. So we're gonna talk, there's gonna be kind of like a, a mirror going on during this webinar. We're gonna talk about seven mistakes people make, very commonly make during their product demos that cause failure, even though they feel like the right thing to do. And then we're gonna talk in parallel to that about the seven things that make your sales demos or your product demos insanely persuasive. So sales demos or product demos feel easy and intuitive. They feel like that, especially if you are armed with a lot of product knowledge. But they only feel that way. They're not actually that way. And the reality is that sales demos, at least effective sales demos, are not easy and intuitive. They are hard and they're counterintuitive. So they're counterintuitive. And I think it is worth dwelling on this word for just a minute because there are some very uh, kind of scary implications with that word if you're not armed with the right knowledge to have a persuasive sales demo. And the reason this word, this counterintuitive word, is kind of scary is because you, if you don't understand the counterintuitiveness of an effective demo, you will be led down the wrong path by your own intuition. You will do things that lead to lost deals and what feels right will cause you to lose deals. So, here is just one example of how using your intuition, your untrained intuition, can lead to lost deals. It feels intuitive to do a ramp up style product demo. And by that, you're saving the best for last. You have a grand finale at the end and you're quote unquote building anticipation throughout the product demo until you really just nail them on the head or nail, I, I just totally butchered that <laughs> phrase, but you guys know what I mean. Know what you mean, yeah, building towards something, some, sh some showmanship. Oh, just wait till you see what's next, the big bang at the end. Exactly. Now here, here's an example of how a typical sales rep would approach a quote unquote product demo. Let's say you're a sales rep and you're pitching to some politician that you want to build a city somewhere in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota or something like that. And your approach is to build anticipation. You say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Politician, we'll say Mrs. for this example. Hey, Mrs. Politician, we have got this great plot of land. It's a beautiful plot of land, it's super green. And that's how this project gets started. Well, as we undergo development, after a few years, we're gonna have some sidewalks, we're gonna have some streets, some trees, and hell, we might even have our first stoplight in this town. A few years later, after some uh, heavy development, we'll have our first batch of residences, and maybe we'll even open up a McDonald's. Progress is in the air. And you know what? After about a decade of investing in building this city, we'll have a thriving community, a vibrant economy. It's going to be gorgeous. Well, to the untrained eye, that felt like the, un the right approach to do. We're starting with something small and getting bigger and bigger, and we're building anticipation for this grand finale, which is this gorgeous city. But the problem is Mrs. Politician is busy, and it probably took her 20 minutes to sit through that pitch and to get to the point. All the while, you thought you were building anticipation, and she was sitting in a bask of frustration waiting for you to get to the point. You ended up losing the deal to somebody who took the counterintuitive but effective approach, which is they started with the last part of the demo first. And they peeled back the conversation to Mrs. Politician's level of interest. They said, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build this, what we're looking at here. We have detailed plans for achieving this and I am happy, Mrs. Politician, to unpack those plans to the level of desire or to the level of detail that you desire. We have just smacked her over the top of the head with the end result, 
we have started with the grand finale rather than finished with it. And because we did that, we won the business from the first sales rep. And now, if she is extremely detail oriented, she's going to ask question after question after question, and she's going to get into the level of detail that she wants. But it's not up to us to determine what level of detail or orientation she has. Maybe she doesn't really want that much detail. She asks two questions and says, you know what? Love it. I have my stamp of approval on it. Let's do it. I love that. And you know what? I like I'm, my favorite thing about this is how you've framed it as counterintuitive versus intuitive. Because I think like to a seller, it feels intuitive to tell like a narrative, right? Like beginning, middle, end. Right. To the prospect, it actually feels more intuitive to hear first, like, where are you taking me? Yes. Yeah. Especially a busy prospect. Yeah. So it's counterintuitive to to the seller, but but this is about getting on the same plane as whoever's right. having the pitch. Right. Now, the majority of the insights we're about to share with you uh, are based on data. And if you are a, you know, a gong, if you're part of the gong audience, you're probably familiar with our methods. We've recorded, transcribed, and analyzed at this point far beyond 3 million recorded demos and sales conversations that are typically done over Zoom or go to webinar. And here's how this works, just to, you know, high level for those of you who have not been familiarized with our research, we record these plot or these demos we transcribe them and we analyze them with AI, separating the seller and the buyer to identify selling behaviors and buyer behaviors. We also analyze the video. So we're identifying what was shared during like your typical web conference platform, whether it was like a slide deck presentation, product demo, face-to-face -face webcam. And then we correlate all of this data that the AI is able to identify with success outcomes. Typically, that is found in the CRM, close rates, average deal size, sales cycle. And that helps us give a data-driven view into what is actually working in sales. And while all of this is correlation and not causation, I would be very careful to stress that, correlation still should not be discounted because it can point us in some very useful directions. So that leads us to principle one, which we've already covered, it is not, what you don't want to do is build anticipation and save the best for less, as we just illustrated. What you do want to do is flip your demo upside down and start your demo with what you had planned at the end. The most valuable piece of your demo should be right at the beginning. And here's kind of an illustration of the data. We already walked through the principle, but over here on the left, we're looking at a pie chart. And these are business problems that were discussed during the discovery phase of the sales process. And you can see in this example, the topic of coaching was discussed more than anything else, dubbing it priority number one. Well, if this was the case, a successful demo flow follows in order of importance the priorities that were discussed during discovery. So instead of saving coaching, the coaching use case of the demo for the end, thinking you're you know, coming up with this big grand finale, you start with that. And then you get into the less valuable parts of the demo if you get into them at all. This is perfect. I love that you brought up discovery because um, I, just like, just because I know what's coming in this deck, everybody, everybody that's watching, just keep discovery in the back of your mind as you listen to these insights, because a lot of what Chris is sharing is about how you can execute during the demo, but it also has some implications for things that are necessary in your discovery process to be able to do some of these things right. Yeah. A demo without discovery is guessing. Yeah. It's guessing. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here kind of here's a sneak peek of all seven things we're going to look at. It is intuitive to build anticipation. It's intuitive to build as much value as possible, to focus on benefits, to respond to questions with a scripted or well prepared answer, to name drop big cust big time customers, to prove ROI, and to ask for next steps. All seven of these things are intuitive. They are what feel right. And that is exactly the problem because they feel so right. So many people are doing them and they can lead to failure. We are going to de 
debunk all seven of these and we're going to show you seven alternatives that can make your product demos insanely persuasive. And we've already covered the first one, which is flip your demo upside down. Let's get into the second one. And notice every, every thing that I'm about to show you is counterintuitive. When we first looked at this word at the beginning of this webinar, the word counterintuitive was scary. Because if you don't know that a, an effective product demo is counterintuitive, it'll cause you to lose deals. But when you are armed with the knowledge that you're going to learn in the rest of this webinar, the counterintuitive nature of a product demo becomes your best friend. If you're a rep, it will dramatically increase your income. And if you're a sales leader, it will dramatically increase the success of your sales organization. So that leads us to principle number two, or element number two of insanely persuasive sales demos. Now, it is not build as much value as possible. That's what feels like the right thing to do. What you should do is give them just a taste. And so just a quick story, when I first started my sales career, I violated this all the time. I was a rep and I thought logically that the right way to win somebody was to show them as much of my product as possible, framing it in the most positive light as possible, or as possible all the way through, thinking that the more I showed them, the more I was justifying the cost. You know, it's like, we can do this, 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 this. I've built so much value. There's no way that the price tag is going to look too big to them by the time I'm through with them. And it turns out that's, <laughs> it turns out that's actually what causes failure. The more you show, the less you say. You should write that down on a sticky note. The more you show, the more you show, the less you say. And so here are just a few quick stats. Um, in our research, top performers tend to be punchy with their demos and their presentations. Their demos are shorter. They don't tend to do anything specific for more than nine minutes, whether that's following a slide deck or a demo or a section of the demo. They change things up every nine or 10 minutes. And they spend 39% less time discussing product features. They show fewer features in successful demos, not more, which is what I thought you should do. And what this approach tends to do, and a guy named Peter Cohan, who is like the king of product demos, he calls these vision generation demo, demos. They're not a product tour or a tutorial. They generate a vision in your buyer's mind. And I think I just skipped a slide here. And the way you create a vision in your buyer's mind is you stimulate, stimulate their imagination. You just show them a little bit of your demo because if you show them everything, you're not leaving anything up to their imagination versus just showing them a few parts. Now, when you do that, when you only show them a taste of your product demo, you tend to get a lot more questions and that is a good thing. So maybe you just showed them the most important part of your product feature and you just describe it as concisely as possible what happens is their head starts spinning. They go, w wait a second, how did I get here? Or how did we get here? And that's a good thing. Because now you can peel the onion back down to their level of preferred detail. They might have 70 questions for you and they're very detail oriented, but that's perfect because you're letting them dictate that rather than spraying and praying. They might only have one or two questions and then you can move on to the next. So the principle here is just show them a taste and let them bring you down to the level of detail that, uh, that they need. I had uh, a demo recently from an SEO product that I happen to know is great because I know people that use it. And that's the other thing, by the way, showing all of the features in a demo, like walking through everything is kind of unnecessary because chances are the prospect has done their research. They've already asked their LinkedIn network, their colleagues, their Slack group, uh, you know, everybody about the, whether or not they should go with your product. Yeah. And yeah. I had, one of the... I, had, I had a demo and, um, you know, there was one feature, two features that I knew I really wanted to use. Um, and this product did other things that I didn't know about. So during the demo, I was learning about all these other things that it did that I didn't know about before. And I didn't need any of them. And mm. so, like by showing me all of those features, I realized I was only going to be using 40% of the product instead of what I thought was 
and it immediately made me think maybe it's not the right product for me. Yeah. Or, Hey, can we get a discount because we're not going to use all those other features? Exactly. I'm only now, 20% of it. now I, I do want to make one point. There are certain situations where showing a person parts of your product that they didn't know even existed can be valuable, but you have to set the stage for that to resonate. You have to educate them so that by the time you show them that part of your product, they're going to value it versus just showing them a complete tour of your product, hoping, hoping that, you know, the whole is going to be greater than the sum of the parts. And the more you show, the more value you're quote unquote building. Yeah. Yeah. In my case, you know, they had done the discovery. They knew how I wanted to use the product and they were still showing me things that they knew I had no use case for. Cool. Yeah. Now, the principle here is you can think of your messaging, the, the voice over that goes with your demo and the number of screens you show is like a, a glass of whiskey. So if you pour just a few drops of water into a glass of whiskey, you've got like, you've got a night to be reckoned with. I'll call it, I'll put it that way. But if you flood it with too much water, which is the equivalent of showing too many screens, too many features and talking too much, you dilute your message. And the more you say, the less people remember. All right, so that leads us to principle number three of having insanely persuasive sales demos. And what is intuitive is to focus on the benefits. Notice I didn't even say features there, which is probably what you were expecting, but focus on the benefits. And I would argue there's something much more powerful you can do before you ever talk about benefits, and it is to focus on tearing apart the status quo so that benefits have a fertile ground for landing. And that leads us to this uh, behavioral economics principle called loss aversion. And loss aversion is this principle where people will work twice as hard to avoid, from, to avoid losing something than they will to gain a benefit. Uh, I, I heard a story about some CEO of like a financial advisory company and he was giving a speech about like career advice that he learned from being a financial advisor for so long. And he said, if you call a multimillionaire at 5 a.m. and you tell them, I have an opportunity for you to make $20,000, but you have to act right now, they're going to curse you out and hang up the phone because you're selling a benefit. But if you call that same multimillionaire, and you call them at 5 a.m. and you say, I have an opportunity for you, or not an opportunity, I can s prevent you from losing $20,000, but you have to act right now. They are going to graciously thank you and tell you to go act on that. It is the same amount of money, but one is about gaining $20,000 and one is a prevention from losing $20,000 they already have. So how does that apply to product demos? Well. The most amateur product demoer in the world is gonna focus on the features of their product. A step up from that is gonna be someone who focuses on the benefits of their product. The true superstars, the highest earning salespeople in the world, focus on the pain of the status quo before they even start thinking about because that triggers loss aversion. And if you think about any product, it is designed to get your customer from point A, which is status quo, to point B, which is desired outcome. And most salespeople focus the entirety of their product demo's message on how great point B is instead of how unsustainable point A is for whatever reason. And so here's an example of what that would look like, just in like a condensed sales pitch. And just full disclosure, I got this uh, from a book um, conversations that win the complex sale. That's where this example comes from. Point B pitch, let's say we're selling formaldehyde free furniture. Okay, formaldehyde is like some crazy chemical that I'm sure does unspeakable things to you. I don't really know what it does. But the point B pitch, which is over here on the left, the focus on benefits would be we supply formaldehyde free furniture. It's healthier, greener, your customers are gonna love it, they'll buy more. Okay, somewhat resonant. Point A pitch, where you talk about how unsustainable the status quo is, is American citizens are becoming more health conscious about dangerous chemicals. Google search for the term formaldehyde free furniture is up 600% in two years. We help retailers make good on this opportunity 
by supplying formaldehyde-free furniture. And what this pitch does is it introduces an external trend to your customer's world that threatens their status quo. In other words, you're framing the conversation as supply this kind of furniture and you get to maintain everything you know and love today. If you don't, things are probably gonna get worse because consumers are trending this way. Uh, so how, so see, I'm imagining a salesperson approaching me and basically telling me everything I'm doing right now sucks. <laughs> so like, how does this um, fear, uncertainty, doubt, I don't know if you would call it a fear, uncertainty, doubt approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause it's, I don't know, like what's the balance between to, to kind of tracking the status quo. Do you have any tips on how to do that delicately? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have one specific technique, and it is to introduce an external trend that's happening that threatens their status quo that is of no fault of their own. So our example here at Gong is we say how you sell has become more important than what you sell. It's no longer sustainable for you to win against your competition by relying on your product. You have to have amazingly good sales conversations. And then we introduce this external trend that makes that happen, which is the world has exploded in competition. If you look just for example, at the MarTech landscape, mm -hmm. in 2011, there were 150 vendors. Today, there are 5,000. That is a big jump. Great products aren't going to cut through that clutter anymore. You have to have amazingly good sales conversations. So really the tip is don't trash the buyer. Don't trash anything about them. Introduce something that's happening in the world that threat that threatens their status quo. You're not threatening their status quo. Something else is something out there in the world. Right. Okay. So my Zoom thing is in the way. What's this? Principle number four. Principle number four of having insanely effective sales demos. Uh, it feels intuitive to respond to questions with well prepared answers. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but even more powerful is to maintain control of the conversation and defer certain questions or deflect certain questions in a particular way. And so here's one example. Top performing salespeople during their demos dictate when pricing is going to be discussed during the course of that demo. And you can see this red line surges toward the end of the demo, which is what uh, the trend that successful demos follow. And they do not talk about pricing until the end. The principle there is to establish value before you talk pricing because now that pricing will be anchored and compared to the value that you've demonstrated so far. Mm -hmm. And so you can see what happens here toward the beginning is pricing questions tend to come up. The customer says, oh, th this is cool. You know, it's your five minutes in, but what, what's the price? And unsuccessful salespeople will tend to answer with the price then and there. And now, armed with pricing information, the customer goes through the rest of the demo kind of tainted in that way. Instead of being exposed to value first, they're exposed to price first, and that greatly affects their perception. And so tactic here is to maintain control of the conversation, you set the agenda, and prevent that question from ever coming up by setting a contract up front. You say, we're gonna cover this, this, and this. Once we go through this, I'm going to give you pricing information. We'll save that discussion for the end. Is there anything you'd like to add or remove from that agenda? 99% of the time they're gonna say, nope, let's get going. And you've successfully avoided them asking for price before you've established value. So this gets to, this is like a good way to balance um, when you start peeling back layers of the onion, right? You've given them the taste. And then they start asking different levels of questions. You know, eventually they may ask about price, but if you tell them up front, you will discuss pricing at the end. Maybe you've preempted them from asking that too early. Yeah, yeah, and it's always a lot easier to that question from coming up than to try to deflect it like after mm -hmm. it does. It's, you know, it's like they ask for pricing five minutes in, and it's this friction. Uh, like full of friction interaction where you're like happy to share price with you. Do you mind if I get through the demo first? And then they're kind of like, I mean, I guess. And you can tell they're like a little bit annoyed with that tactic versus just look, I'm going to tell you price. Uh, we're going to go through the demo. We're going to talk about price at the end. And if this makes sense, we'll discuss some next steps. How does that sound? And that tends to work out a lot better. 
thing I would say about this is there are many exceptions to this principle. Okay, sometimes you might sell a SaaS product or another product that is like, you know, it's fairly low ticket where it might be okay to tell pricing up front. In fact, you might even have pricing on your website. So you kind of have to be the judge of this, but in general, it's always better to establish value before price and maintain control of the agenda of the conversation, so long as it's an agenda that aligns with um, the needs of your buyer. Right. Now the next part of maintaining control of the conversation is not letting objections derail you. Any demo, whether it's successful or unsuccessful, is going to have some sort of objection and or concern. And the way you not only address the objection effectively, but maintain control of the conversation is to respond to objections with a clarifying question. You can see according to these charts, that is what successful salespeople do most of the time. And the reason that's so effective is objections are typically rife with misunderstanding there's probably a root cause to that objection where if you answer the surface level objection without clarifying it, you're probably answering the right thing and you're introducing friction and misunderstanding to the sales process. Now, one thing I would caution you to avoid is responding to objections with the question, why? So an example would be, I think your pricing is too high. Never say, why do you feel like that? Because the word why whether your intention uh, is tuned this way or not, is a threatening question. It puts the buyer on the defensive. It makes it seem as if you're challenging the validity of the objection. Here's your tip. You can change any why question and swap it out with the words, what caused you? It is the same question. It gets at the same thing. It removes the threatening nature of the question. And just about any objection, and there are exceptions to this, can be responded to with, can you help me understand what's causing that concern? It's a great question that you can immediately apply on your next sales call when you get your next objection. I think this is a great, I love this tip. Because the thing is, like, we all talk about objection handling. Prospects do not want their objections to be handled. <laughs> It's annoying to them and they, they actually become more entrenched. If you give them a great reason, logic, sound logic reason why their objection maybe doesn't make the most sense, it, they're only going to become more entrenched in their previous position. It's like, um, you know, your relatives arguing about politics at Thanksgiving. Like nobody's God. opinion is changing. Help me. <laughs> But if you just seek to understand it in like a non-threatening way, I love this. Can you help me understand what's causing that concern? You're just seeking to understand. Just help yeah. me be on your team. Uh, uh, you know, I want to help make sure this is the right purchase for you. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, we have uh, an objection handling course just chock full of actionable tips like this for um, you know, I know you just said you hate this word, but handling objections. So if anybody's interested in really growing your skills and mastering objection handling, take a quick screenshot of this, um, of this slide and go to the link that I have provided below and you can register for the course. It is rich with tactics and strategies for um, handling objections in the way we've talked about. But moving on. What are we at? Principle number five. All right, just moving the Zoom thing out of the way for having insanely effective sales demos. So it feels intuitive to name drop some big time customers. We work with Walmart, uh, Marriott, we work with Nike. That's what feels intuitive, but it leads to failure. And the right thing to do is avoid generic social proof like this, like the plague. And so here's a little bit of data. When a sales rep used social proof techniques, telling customer stories, name dropping customers, in general, there is a major drop in close rates by 47%, which is very counterintuitive because any salesperson or marketer is trained from the beginning of their career that social proof is a good thing. Well, I'm not saying social proof is a bad thing, but what I am saying is that it is a sales technique that is akin to playing with fire. If you don't know how to use it, you are going to get burned. But if you do know how to use it, it can be very interesting. And it's like bringing a flamethrower to a stick fight. 
you can <laughs> it is you can close dramatically more deals by using social proof in the right way but most people are not using it the right way they are spectacularly misapplying it and here's how most salespeople use social proof throughout a demo they're coming up to the end and they say something like by the way we work with all of these big customers nasa marriott nike tropicana and they start rattling off the latest and greatest case studies that marketing provided with or provided them with but in most of the cases they're going to get a reaction like this where the customer responds with some skepticism or just you know that's a great story, but our situation is way different. Or they might even be a little more abrupt and say, I don't care if Walmart or Google's your customer, we're nothing like them. And what that causes is alienation. You are communicating to your customers or your buyer in this case that you work with people who are not like them and they start to mentally conclude that your product must not be for them. So anytime you're using social proof in sales, the question that's going to buyer's mind are, is, is the customer the sales rep is talking about, are they like me? Are they part of my tribe in some way? Are they in my industry or do they have the same business problem that I'm dealing with right now? So here's an example to make this really concrete. I'm going to show you how a bad sales rep would use social proof, an average sales rep would use it, and how a superstar mega earner uses social proof. Yeah. So let's pretend we're selling, yeah, mega earner. Let's pretend we're selling marketing or to a marketing software company like Marketo, Eloqua, those types of companies. We're selling to that organization. Here's how a bad sales rep would do it. They would say, we work with Walmart, Oracle, and Fidelity. What the decision maker of this MarTech company concludes is, none of these companies are really like me, so I don't think I'm the best fit for this product. Here's how an average seller would do it. Say we work with Marketo, Orca, Oracle, and Instapage. We've just successfully listed three companies that are at least vaguely in our buyer space. The problem is this is only an average approach because any Joe Schmo sales rep can rattle off two or three customers that are in the same quote unquote as the buyer. Now let's talk about how the mega earner would do this. They would pull up the marketing technology landscape and they would draw a circle around every customer of theirs that works, that they work with in this landscape. And they would say, these are all of the companies in your space. That's what we're looking at here. We work with 17 of them. And that number is up from just four, two years ago, meaning just about everybody in your space is aware of us and starting to work with us or already working with us. And the power in this message is not that you work with any of these individual customers. The power behind that kind of message is that there is a movement toward your solution. People are bandwagoning. It's not about one or two or even three of those customers. It is about a tribe jumping on a new trend and you are that trend. That example, that last example, of social proof from the mega earner makes the first examples look like anti-social proof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, it's almost a joke. It's like tone deaf, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now, just like the objection handling one, take a screenshot of this screen. We have an amazingly effective course on how to tell customer stories that close dramatically more deals. You get a 21 minute video, a cheat sheet and a slide deck it is insanely effective. Go check it out, take a screenshot, go over to that link and moving on to principle number six. So principle number six, what does that tell us? It feels right to prove ROI. How could it not feel right to prove ROI? And it turns out that that is actually not an effective way to build a business case. The best way to build a business case is by telling before and after customer stories. So just a quick piece of data. This is unpublished yet so far, by the way. We're going to publish this in a couple of weeks. You guys on this webinar, you're first to see this. The more a sales rep discusses ROI, the ROI of their solution to a potential buyer, the less success they tend to experience. There's a 27% drop in close rates. And I'm the first to acknowledge that could be total correlation and not causation. It could be, I mean, there are a few things you could conclude from this. It could be proving ROI doesn't work. 
It could be most attempts at proving ROI are so poorly executed that they backfire. And it could also be sales reps are only trying to prove ROI to customers who said they didn't want to buy and it's like their desperate attempt to save the deal. Doesn't really matter which scenario it is because the technique I'm about to show you for building business the right way transcends all three of those scenarios and makes it right. So what tends to happen when you prove ROI or attempt to calculate ROI is the customer argues with your assumptions. And that, that happens in virtually every ROI discussion I've ever seen. And if you have an online ROI, cal ROI calculator, customers are probably thinking that. And by the way, that is not me saying you should not have an ROI calculator on your website. We have one at Gong. I'm just making a point here. People will argue with your assumptions. They'll say we're different or that assumption is too big of a leap or something like that. And so what you do instead to prove ROI is tell before and after customer stories where your customer had a certain set of metrics and achieved another set of metrics. The beauty of this is number one, they can't argue with your assumptions because you're just showing what happened to somebody else. And number two, you're telling a story which deactivates the critical logical part of your customer's brain that wants to argue with all of your assumptions. When you're doing a bunch of math with them, and saying it's gonna to apply to their situation, you are activating the part of their brain that wants to argue with you. When you tell a story of somebody else, even though you're talking math, now you're activating the lizard or the emotional part of their brain and humans are run on stories, okay? That, that is like how we live our lives. So this is by far the better way to build your business case. And tuned, follow Gong on LinkedIn, we're going to have some groundbreaking research that goes a lot more deeply on these topics of building the business case. Always. One of my favorite places to get new research is from, from you guys on LinkedIn. Amazing. All right. We're coming up to a close here. Lucky number seven. It feels right to ask for next steps at the end. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, that's all most sales reps do. And what makes most sense is to not just ask for next steps at the end, but ask for those next steps at the beginning. And so here's kind of like an example of a timeline of a sales call. Uh, this is like a little bit of a clunky graph, but each one of these are a timeline of a sales call. And the yellow shows us how long was spent discussing next steps at the end. And we can see that in the shortest sales cycle deals, 53% more time was spent next steps at the first introductory meeting. Now, that's totally intuitive, but the problem is if you don't do a few proactive things to reserve that next steps or that time allotted to discuss next steps, you're going to quote unquote try to pencil it in at the end and you're not going to spend very much time and the customer's going to be in a hurry to get off the phone and it's probably just not going to work out the way you want it. Um, a quick couple stats before we get into the technique to do instead is close rates actually decline by 71% if you don't discuss next steps at all at the end. I think that's intuitive to most people, except I would bet that most people underestimated how big that drop actually is. And you can see here what's a little bit disturbing is that next steps are not covered nearly as often as they should be. So we're lightly covering next steps most of the time. A quarter of the time, we don't do it at all, even if the deal's qualified. And only 17% of the time do we really devote that uh, thorough amount of time really mapping out what this project plan is going to look like for the customer. So here's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, when you say 53% more time on faster deals, do you know, or do you guys have data for how long that is? How much time is actually being spent? With we do have the data somewhere buried in our data archives. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I would be happy to answer that in some way if anybody's interested. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and if that, that's your specific question, you don't just shoot me a LinkedIn message and I'll go into our data archives and I'll get that answer for you. Thanks. Yep. So instead of just reserving next steps at the end, the goal, the way to achieve this is by getting the agreement to discuss next steps at the end of the call at the beginning of the call, which is 
what an upfront contract is. And it sounds something like this. You start your call, you set the agenda and say, by the end of this call, I'd like you to be in a position where you're either interested, we map out a next step, or you're not interested, we go our separate ways and maybe we could be friends or something like that, I don't know. And what you've just done is you've gotten permission in advance to spend a significant amount of time at the end of the call to talk about next steps instead of quote unquote penciling it in. And by the way, just a quick language tip, never use the words pencil in when you're trying to secure next step. It is really weak language. That's a good tip. I love how actionable you make these tips, Chris. <laughs> well, that brings us to everything. So we have covered seven elements of insanely persuasive product demos. If you're a sales leader listening to this, you know that product demos are an important part of your sales conversation puzzle, but they're only one part of it. And to have insanely persuasive customer facing conversations, I would urge you to go check out a demo of Gong. Go to gong.io slash demo and you can see how this technology can help your entire team have insanely persuasive demos, discovery calls, objection handling scenarios, et cetera. Um, but with that, uh, I don't know about you, Colin, but I think we're good to open it up to some Q&A. What do you think? Yeah, I think we've got some time and we have some good questions too. Um, right. so here's one about pricing. Um, so somebody asks, what happens if a prospect only wants to talk about pricing? That was Fabian Ramirez. Thanks for the question, Fabian. So I'm only going off of my personal experience here. Um, there could be many exceptions to this, but that tends to happen and somebody is adamant about getting to price right out of the gate in the sales process before even getting to anything else. They have typically already decided to buy from your competitor and they're doing their due diligence of price shopping and you probably don't have a qualified deal. Yeah. That's what I've seen. So similar question. Um, you know, in that case, somebody's kind of throwing your agenda out the window and they have their own agenda. Maybe they aren't telling it to you, but, but they're just there to, to do something else. So uh, like, what if somebody, you know, a lot of what the tips you discussed um, hinge on your ability to set the agenda at the start to say, mm -hmm. Let me discuss pricing later. I want to show you a few things first um, to say we're going to have time at the end to set up the most important next steps that make sense. But what happens when somebody challenges your agenda in another way? That's great. And in fact, you, so you should set the agenda with the buyer at the beginning. You don't have to be, you know, just hard nosed about keeping exactly what you plan to cover. But the point is to set the agenda and I would even set the agenda at the beginning and then pass it over to the customer and say, is there anything you would want to add or remove from that? Because that makes them feel like they're in control, but really you're still in control because you're setting the agenda. Now, most of the time, they're not going to have anything or they might have something that is actually beneficial for you to know about. Yep. Very times will they say, uh, yeah, we're going to take a 90 degree turn and we're just going to talk about price right out the gate and then I'll decide if I'm interested. If that ends up happening, again, I go to the answer to the question I, that I was just asked a few minutes ago, which is you probably got a concerning deal on your hands. It's probably not the best deal to be working. But even though that tip is maintain control of the conversation, you still want to let the customer in on that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, so control doesn't look like you talking all the time. Control no. Looks like you getting buy-in on some small things like what's this conversation going to be about? Mm -hmm. It's having a plan. It's having a plan, right? Yeah. And if your customer wants in on the creation of that plan, that's actually a good thing because now they have a sense of ownership over it. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we talked a little bit about the role, the importance of a good discovery at the beginning mm -hmm. of this. And we got a couple of questions throughout actually that I think have to do with discovery. So for instance, um, where'd it go? We have to rediscover this. I have to dis rediscover my discovery question. Um, I'll, I'll go to a different one. It's going to come back to me. So is there a data proven like ideal demo flow? This is from Alex Wickwire. Is there an ideal demo flow 
for qualifying questions or like conversation balance between rep and prospect during a demo? I'm guessing they're talking about the talk to listen ratio, which Gong mm -hmm. is pretty famous for publishing. Um, what we found is that the talk to listen ratio for a successful demo and an successful demo is more or less the same. It's about 65% of the time. And so what that tells me is, yes, you don't want to steamroll your customers. You know, if you get up to 75 or 80% of the time, that's a bad thing. But there is a lot more to running a good demo than just talking as little as possible. That's, it's everything that we've covered here. Discovery is different though. The difference between a successful discovery interaction and an unsuccessful one, very different talk to listen ratios. Yeah. Very different. Right. So, so to the extent that, you know, a good demo relies on good discovery, how much do you think top performing reps are doing additional like on the fly discovery during the demo? And then always. The yeah, always. Now, now, so, so discovery is not an event, it's a process. Right. It's something you're continually doing and redoing and reevaluating through the entire sales process, not just discovery and demo calls, but you also want to remember not to make it seem like you're interrogating the customer. Okay, you need to, the principle to follow is have a strong two-way dialogue. Yep. Um, that means two things not to do, overly pitch, but it also means do not be interrogative. You know, have a conversation. Don't just, you know, shine the light on their face and question and question and question. <laughs> yeah. Tell me your budget. Yeah. Bam. Um, in which part of the conversation should you, this one's from Jackie Hartzell. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, how do you, blah, blah, blah. which part of the conversation do you include pricing questions during, like, do you set aside time for explicit questions? Do you address it when there's a question that they ask that implies a question about pricing or just when you think the customers realized that they need your product? Have you established value? Yeah. That's not a black and white binary thing. Uh, your sense of whether you've established value is going to be fine tuned as you gain more sales experience, but that's the question you should ask yourself. Have you established value? And if you feel like you have, then you can give pricing information. As far as unpacking the details of your pricing model, it's the same thing as we've talked about, which is unpack it to the level your customer um, needs to know, but do not be confusing about it because the confused mind says no. So your pricing needs to be clear, crisp, easily understandable, right. aside from justified. So um, we got another good question about discovery, also from Jackie. Um, Maybe we should have done discovery instead of demos on this. That'll be our next well, one. <laughs> you no, know, I think everybody likes the tips and they're just concerned that their discovery isn't good enough. But guys, all right. I think the cool thing about all these tips is like these are things that you can start doing today. Like you can have hop on a demo this afternoon and do these things differently. Um, so, but what if you get a demo from like a requested demo? With you guys at Gong, when you get a requested demo from gong.io slash demo, is there a discovery call and then an actual demo or am I going to get a demo when I go fill out that form and like, how do you handle? So for in, the principle is to stay aligned with your buyer's buying process. And in that case, they have already defined their problem and started seeking solutions and they want to validate whether your solution is the best solution. So with that in mind, you don't want to put them through a clunky process of first, we're going to have a 30 minute discovery call. Assuming I like what I hear, yeah. then we're going to schedule a second demo. What you should do is do kind of a joint discovery slash demo on the first meet. Mm -hmm. You still need to do both. So there is going to be at least a sense of misalignment because you're going to have to ask some questions to really understand what the customer wants to get to. But no, you should not defer a demo out into the future if that's what they want. You just have to go, you kind of have to finagle your way in those situations. Right, right. By the way, the question you ask at the beginning of the call, very important. You should not be asking questions about, um, you want to ask a question that aligns with their mental buying process. So if they're already in the mind of seeking a solution, rather than asking about the problem, which you can eventually come back to, 
you ask a question that aligns with that mental state, which is, help me understand what you're trying to achieve by taking a look at Gong. And now they're talking about the vision of a solution, which is where they are mentally, instead of, you know, the typical checklist of discovery calls that you planned on asking. Right, right. They, they, you get their imagination going a little bit about yeah. um, what the beautiful world they're going to live in is going to be like. And then you can go back to the problem. You ask that question, what are you trying to achieve? They tell you, and now you can say something like, great, so what higher order business problem are you trying to trying to solve by achieving that? But right. the first question you ask should align with where they are mentally. Right. Good stuff. So um, we've got plenty of time for more questions, so we can keep going if you have time. Here's another yep. good one from David Kadrin. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, David. What's an effective amount of information to send to a prospect before a call for a demo? And we had another question earlier that actually may link up with this. And the question earlier was, should you send the agenda in advance? So like, how do you queue up the demo beforehand? I think it's worth experimenting with that. I think it's going to be too different. Like everybody's sales process or every company's sales process is going to be too different for me to give a one size fits all answer. Um, I can't imagine a negative reason to sending an agenda before the call via email and saying, let me know if there's anything you want to add or remove from this. Mm -hmm. I have seen some sales leaders send their sales call deck before the meeting even starts. They send it to the prospect and say, if you have time, go over this and let me know what you want to discuss when we get on the meeting. And sometimes they'll look at like slide two, seven, and 12 and be like, that's something I want to talk about. That is, that is. And now you've got, so I mean, I don't see a negative to doing any of these things. I would say, try it, see what results you come up with. Yeah. And again, like, I think some of these questions, people, you know, we all want the silver bullet guys, but just remember that a lot of this is correlation and really all of this is worthy of testing yourself. 100%. This is Chris's data from analyzing 3 million calls, but that's across a few industries, companies in different growth stages. You can, you, you know, you can test this out for yourself. I think the principle behind all of this is that data should lead your decision-making, including um, how your reps are executing their calls. Dude, you nailed it. Data should lead your decision-making. It should not dictate your decision-making though. Right. Use your judgment. And with that little lecture <laughs> and on the importance of data, it looks like we can stop to the questions. Everybody, thank you so much for joining. I thought it was a lively discussion. You guys asked amazing questions. Chris, thanks so much for sharing all your genius insights from your 3 million calls. Um, Lydia Sugarman said this was a great demo. <laughs> so, and we've got tons of thank yous rolling in. So thank you so much. The whole community really appreciates you being here.